coming out. This Friday, we do have Judy Jacob uh, from New York doing a, uh, a lecture on, what does she call that? Uh, algae, lichens, and marble monuments, something along those lines. That's not the exact title, but her, her uh, the, the, uh, the lecture- Biofilms. Biofilms, right, biofilms. So her lecture is talking about the ecology of organisms, microorganisms that live on marble. So that should be pretty interesting. So tonight we have, we are doing crust fungi and resupinate polypores. We kind of put them together. I hope everyone was able to uh, join in um, last Friday for Alden Dirk's really good lecture on the ecology of crust fungi. So I'm not gonna go too, I don't, I don't wanna review, redo the stuff that he was going over because I think he explained it pretty well you know, what crust fungi are. And one of the things I really took away from it was uh, the, the definition crust fungi is somewhat objective, right? Be uh, defined as a bunch of different ways. Um, but let me, let me start off tonight by asking um, who actually has stuff that they would like to share. I know I received some emails from a few people. Um, let's get a, a queue going. So I kind of have an idea of how much time we have. So if you could type your name into the chat if you have stuff that you would like to share tonight. Uh, so Dorothy's asking if the webinar was recorded. It was, it usually takes me a couple of weeks before I get the recording though. Um, Tom Bigelow records it and then it just, I'd set the way for him to give it to me. Um, so hopefully that will, that video will come out. So I'm not seeing anybody here with um, any, Thing that they want to share, right? So is that correct? Okay, good. Um, Marisol, you had mentioned earlier, but I you didn't respond to my email. You had mentioned about um, showing some of your stuff that uh, you're working on. Yeah. Do you want to do that? Yeah, and I also send another a second email with like a little group too. But I can show my my work in progress if you want to. I, I did I see that. Shows what they want. How long, do, how long do you think that is? Oh, I don't know. I haven't measured. I haven't timed it. I don't know. This is a work in progress. Are you ready to show it? If you're not ready to show it. I am, I am but it's not finished, but I can show a portion of it. Well, why don't we do that? Because um, it sounds like we have we have stuff from maybe like five or six people okay. um, to look at as far as crust fungi. But Marisol's been working on a uh, uh, presentation. So I don't know, 15 minutes or so, Marisol? Yeah, okay. You just cut me and yeah. Okay. So okay. Do, do, do I go now? Yeah, why don't you take it All away? Right. Let me see if I can do it, okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. Wait. <gasps> I can. Nice. How I make it bigger? One second. One, one second, slide show. Okay, start from first slide. All right. Ooh, what's that? Oh my gosh. Ooh, come back. How you go back? How you go back and look? Maybe escape. Oh, yes, I did. I did. Okay. So I don't know why there are other frames appearing in there, but at least this is not showing it where I, at least it's showing it to you because it's um, just making it better. So my presentation is called Fall in Love with Crossed Fungi. And the image that I have here is Flebiopsis crassa. Flebiopsis means like flavia. And then Crassus, the species, is the purple one, as you can see. And it has, um, yeah, that's good enough. So I go to the second one. Okay, so what is a cross fungi? Uh, oh, oh, it's wrong. I have all sort of uh, mistakes, but it'll be fixed. And then the second aspect will be micromorphology, then micromorphology, and then at the end, sources and resources. So um, tips for collecting them and getting the spores and working on them. And here I, I have a few examples of different types of crusts. The first one is botulobacidium conspersum, which is an, an asexual stage, but people who, of a crust, a regular crust, I mean, if I can say regular, Mm, I can I cannot explain that better. And then the next one is a stereo lobatum, uh, 
people who study cross, they include this in, in their studies, although this belongs to the steroid fungi. Uh, so they are not flat. They are um, a fuse reflexed because they have a, a cap and many times they run like a skin under the wood. Then that- hey. um, Sorry to interrupt. Let me, uh, let, just let, me, let me do this, Frank. Okay, I, I was waiting for her to move on to see if it would scroll down before we do that. So we can only see half of um, your screen there. So uh, I can only see your Botryo uh, Basidian and your Sterium. Your other ones are cut off. So, oh, I see. There is a green thing. Oh, I see. So are you able to minimize your screen a little bit? Nope, that made it worse. <laughs> it made it worse because, yeah, yeah. Let me try to make it smaller. Mm, how that goes. Wait a minute. All right. Let me go here. Oh, how do you do that? Well, you know, Marisol, maybe you're not quite ready for this one yet. It looks like you need maybe to... Okay, that's fine. Then. Okay, we were, we were trying to check out some work that Marisol's been doing since she's our resident crust okay. fungi lover. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we'll come back around to this at some point. Yeah, um, okay. So, Marisol, who are you making this program for? I'm doing it for the West Pennsylvania Mycological Association. Okay, okay. that's I took, okay. I thought it was something like. That. So I'm going to share my screen, and because um, I do have stuff from from Marisol, from Dorothy, from myself, John and Nina, and. Dave. So I'm going to go in the order that I got him from. I think Dave was the first one down here at the bottom. So Dave, do you want to start out with your stuff? And I'm still correct in seeing that nobody else had anything they wanted to share because then I... Yeah, sure. I just yeah, won't... I've got three things up front and then a few other backup things if, the, you know... Sure, might as well look at them all. still have look, time to do. Looks like we have time. Yeah, sure. Just do, look at as many as you want. Some of these things, I don't know what they are. I'm not very good at, at, at um, resupinate polypores and crust fungi. And some of these IDs I've got some help from other people. Um, so this thing here was, was pretty mysterious, really. Um, let me just minimize this. OK. Uh, so this, there's this guy out west, a uh, young guy, Chalia Thomas, I think, calls himself. Um, he thought he knew what this was. It, I wasn't sure I really agreed. And there were a few different proposals made. I found this thing twice. So it's this area down by the Susquehanna River. Uh, it doesn't get real, real cold um, in the winter. And especially like the last two winters were pretty, pretty warm. Um, um, this one's not really all that warm. Um, but um, so I would, I would go down to that area. Uh, maybe January, March, and see what's, what's there. And there's a lot of big old trees that are, some of them are cut down, some of them fell down. Um, and there's a lot of polypores and resupinate sorts of fungi. And so there was pretty much, honestly, I go there and look for that stuff then because there's really nothing else to find um, in January or March. And, but, but still, you know, I, some of these things seem pretty interesting, like this thing. Is, I honestly, I, I, I don't know what this is. It looks can like I, it's not. Can I ask a question, Dave? Did sure. it kind of have a greenish tinge to it? It looks like it might have been slightly. No, I don't think so. Pretty much, I think the color you see there is what is is what it was. Pretty much like gray. That reminds me of Dento Corticium put over Kent's. The way it looks oh, like. okay. The way well, it, the way it looks. Down. The way it looks like after it's like wintered for a while, it gets kind of like yeah. this whitish gray color. But okay, so so that is. Um... What do you think, Marisol? You know that species, right? Yeah, I do, but I don't think so. Then uh, has a, a a little margin on the edge. Like that it does have a margin. No more like um oh fused. No, no, this is no, no like that. It, it, Sometimes I do see it where it's pretty resupinate. Sometimes it has a cap too, but but even when I found it like all it has this green tinge. It's, this one doesn't have like ochre and green. 
Yeah, yeah there was there, there was very little color in this. It was great. I think that's on an old big old beach log. Hmm. There's some really big trees down in this area. Some some of which yeah. have been brought down by storms, and some have been cut down because they they just started leaning over. And this this looks like a probably on a big old beach log. I mean. Yeah, but Compare, be co compare with the with the one he says uh, dento cortison. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dento. Yeah, that 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 yeah. that might be a starting point. Dento. Cortisium. Um, mm -hmm. Puerto Ricense. I've seen this before, and it's been all white. Um, I brought it back from some nymph foray, but. I wasn't successful in figuring out what it was. And the, uh, so these guys were saying maybe Seroporus mollus. That's like Detronia mollus. Yeah, that that's negative 31 confidence. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, it's probably not that. The, I mean, the best proposal we got here was basically Alan Rockefeller says, oh, it's some uh, <laughs> corticiate thing, you know, so. Um, <laughs> and then this guy Chela Thomas, he he said he thought he knew what it was. He didn't. He said um, something. You, Terrena I, unicolor. I just read. That yeah, one, we all I thought he was you. wrong, basically. Nah. Yeah. Um, Terrena has a um, um like a. If, oh gosh, I can't talk today. A maze like maze, more maze like uh, poor surface. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. And he yeah. Has a cap. It has a cap. Yeah, it usually it usually forms at least some caps. This was probably on the underside of this log. This log may have been elevated above the surface of the ground a bit. And um, it may have been more or less on the underside, although the picture seems to suggest that it was not pointing straight downward, you know, because the lighting is pretty good there. And, you know, I didn't use any kind of artificial lighting. So, um, all right. Yeah, a mysterious one. Uh, what do we have here? I forget what I what I put up here actually. Oh, more more mystery fungi. Poria. So if you do a zoom on this, it looks pretty nice. Um this you can see a little bit of detail. So when, when I post something like this on Mushroom Observer, it usually gets named Poria, which is pretty much this generic sort of um, label for, you know, this resupinate stuff that has pores. <laughs> so, I mean, this looks pretty distinctive, though, you know? Polo, yeah, it's unusual. Yeah. So... I, I mean, I don't know what this is, and really nobody else did either. And I thought I'd run it past everybody and see. If, um, doesn't have, it's an interesting little area, this uh, Susquehanna Riverlands. Um, it's it's down by the Susquehanna River. Susquehanna River is really big, you know, um, near this area, which is is near Barwick, Pennsylvania. Um, it tends to stay warmer. Last winter was really pretty warm. Um, so th there were a lot of, it was easy to walk around down there. I mean, right now there's probably, probably about 18 inches of snow in, in, in that area. So how about, how about like Seroporia spisa? Ser okay. Well, I'll check that. Cero. Serio. Seriporia. C-E-R-I. P after the I. C-P-O-R-E-I-A. Seriporia. Then Spisa, S P I S S A. I, that I, be, I, I know that that's an orange resupinate one. That could be that. I, yeah, I don't, I'll check that out. I don't think I got any data on this at all. I just got a picture. That was it. No tramete sinabarinus, baby. Uh, what, what, what's that one, Marcel? Tramete sinabarina, baby. Tramedes sinabarina. Uh, yeah, that, you know, I was Maybe. thinking, mm -hmm. I was thinking that could be young and not, re, you know, oh, not yeah. yeah. But look at look at the size of the pores, though. Um, 
um, the the Cinnabarina types. No, uh, Sanguinea. Yeah, small pores even when they're almost mature. Sanguinea, maybe. Okay, well, okay. I'm That's not more sure. southern and, and very thin. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know. Uh, so that, that's now tremites, right? Yeah, tremites. yeah. Tremites in Abarines or Sanguinea. Well, Sanguinea would seem more, more likely to me. And I have found um, the, the cinnabar types of tremites in this area on beach. This looks like it's also beach. Uh, so that's an interesting proposal, Dorothea. That 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 sort of you know it's worth checking out. I, uh, I've seen some that are very resupinate, you know, um, along with some with caps. So you never know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see any caps here on this particular branch. It looks like beach, um, but I have found. Um, the cinnabar tremides, I which I call cinnabarina or cinnabarinum. I, I never remember how these endings because they always change. But but um, on beach, on big beach logs, like big, you know, fully developed polypores on the beach logs in this area, on, on like really big beach logs, you know, like three foot diameter um, trunks that are down. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's on this smaller thing, maybe you know that's what you get. Dave. Yes. Another way to check is that you dig under it, underneath, and it stains the wood. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be visiting that spot mm. too soon. For the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's there's like 18 inches of snow there right now. <laughs> um, so they, I'm probably not going to be collecting very many fungi for a while around here. It's supposed to get cold now, too. They, yes. I have also found Trametes in Marina as just a crust, very thin, and even yeah. on a leaf, growing on a leaf. On a leaf? Really? And I got the photos in iNaturalist. Yep. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it, that's, it's um, growing on the wood, but it cross over the leaf and develop the cross on the leaf. That's the Trimedes? The Cinnabarina, yeah. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I never would have guessed any of that. Only so, the okay, so I'll, yeah. I'll look up your, your, your stuff on iNaturalist. Go ahead. All right. Okay, so this one's Neoentrudia veriformis. Yeah, this one was pretty much identified by uh, this guy Herbert uh, B Baker. He's a he's a really good identifier. I think he's lives in Massachusetts. Um, I, I I don't know this stuff very well, so I put it up and hope somebody tells me what it is. And this time that worked. And it's a pretty cool looking thing. Um, I, I suppose you can call this resupinate, although it is forming sort of these projections that that are sort of like cap like and i guess that's on, on the lower surfaces of these projections i'm i imagine that's where uh the, the hymenium can we that... see the name please yeah it's a new name um well it's a new genus um and it used to be antrodia oh okay yeah, now it's okay. now it's oh, neo antrodia, which which <laughs> what literally means the new version of antrodia. Right, right. Um, and variaformis and that I didn't know what it was. I put it up there. Um, Danny Newman said that it was probably antrodia, and then this guy Herbert Baker said, "I know what that is. It's antrodia variaformis," and then I just happened to be. Re reviewing some old um, observations of my own. And I, well, looking for some resupinate things to suggest. And I ran across this one and I, and I, and on Mushroom Observer, if a name is depreciated, it will appear in light font, like, like 
the 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 intensity of the font is 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 not dark. It's not like emboldened. So I I knew then. Oh, I guess there's a new name. So I clicked on the name, and I saw that Mushroom Observer suggests that Antodia variformis is now a synonym and a depreciated name for what is now Neo Antridia variformis. I have no idea why what has generated the need for this this new genus here. They, um, yes. In some, in the, this antrodia doesn't have a cap and they call this presentation like nubs. You see, oh, I see. Really so, like it's, cap. so it's actually maybe, maybe there's a, a morphological basis there are few that we're moving that. away from genus Antrodia here. That would be interesting. Um, yeah, maybe. I, I imagine sequencing has something to do with it too. It usually does anyway these days. And I always felt like this growth form is because it's on a, um, you know, it's on a vertical surface. Yeah. If, if this had been growing underneath, it would be your soup and eat. Uh -huh. but, uh -huh. but here it's, uh -huh. it has to project outward in order to get its pores facing downward. But look, it's at not that look at that log that it's on. Look at all those circles. Look, you can see that's like a really old tree sure. that, yeah. that was that was cut up. I think that's probably in that same area. I forget. It's probably in Susquehanna Riverlands because that's where I find most of this kind of stuff. What does it say up there? Oh, no. Ricketts, oh, that was in Ricketts Glen. Oh, well, there's lots of old growth stuff. Stuff in Ricketts Glen. I don't know what kind of. Oh, it says a large hemlock log. Okay, so I guess I noticed what kind of tree it was. There's some really old trees in Ricketts Glen. So okay. this one. So this one, I was looking at that. I saw that it was on hemlock because the first thing I thought of was there's a neo entrodia called Soraliformis. That oh. looks that looks just like this, but that grows on oaks. Oh, okay. And it stains, it stains like a reddish color when you, when you damage it or when like the insects are eating it. Uh -huh. like Look, the, I like, found that one. No, I found cerealis. Neoantrodia cerealis and it has a cap. Uh, not always though. Oh, oh, the one I found. Yeah. Uh, okay. The one I found. Yeah. And Kyle Thomas identified as Neoantrodia cerealis. Cerealis or cerealis uh, formis. Oh, maybe they changed the name now. <laughs> Yeah. something like that something like that <laughs> I, I, think split, I think i think they're splitting them up because some of them are european and some of them are american so yeah uh, it's okay. that it's that game <laughs> yeah so all right oh, okay well i'm glad I, I um suggested that one so here's your stecorina mucrasium yeah, that probably, you know, I, I mean, I learned what this is because of this post, you know, and somebody told me what it was. Uh, if you do a close up, though, on one of these photos, you can see the hymenium is, is, comes out pretty well. It might be the other picture that's, yeah, the other picture is a little better, actually. That's not too bad. The, the other one's actually better in, in close up. I think it's, I think, let me check it out. Let's see. Um, yeah, that's a little bit better, I guess. But you can see all these little teeth. Um, I probably could have figured this out myself. But honestly, you know, bring home a lot of stuff to look at. And if I can put it on Mushroom Observer and somebody's able to tell me what it is, you know, that sort of cuts through a lot of red tape. So, <laughs> so um, I, I thought it was a, a pretty nice um example of, of this thing so i said that's a good it. that's a good picture these are really small aren't they they're not very big yeah yeah they, they, these were actually i believe i believe i remember um that that spread out things on this branch were maybe a little bigger than usual but that's looks like that's probably a pretty small branch so yeah these these are fairly small and it looks like they're some some little cap like projections also yeah it does Dying. yeah so I, it just was a nice observation i thought so i thought i'd include it 
and it fits in with what we're talking about here. So, all right, everyone, see that name? There we go. Yeah, this looks like something that, yeah, this is Danny Newman um, had a suggestion here for this one. This was, this I found on my property on a, um, I think it's probably on an oak. Looks like a little oak that died. And um, so I didn't know what it was. They, but yes. Polaria Strigo Sonata is Merulioi on the hymenium and it's dark. This one doesn't have the merulioid like, treme, like flevia tremelosa, mm -hmm. but it's dark like wine color. I, it could still be it. Um, I, I've seen them very variable bacon strips. <laughs> maybe like, it, maybe this is younger because it looks like it does, it's starting to get like some of that warty look to it, doesn't it? Like in this area. It, it, and it looks more like bacon when it's very old too, and it's and it's black even. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm um, John and Nina have another picture of this one. So. Oh. So so this looks well, if this is correct as Dorothy's saying this is probably a probably a young one, right? Yeah. yeah well, it was proposed at promising level of confidence. So it's, Dan, Danny Newman was not saying like. This is what this is. It was it was a suggestion that he thought was hmm. was a good suggestion. So he, he posted it at level of promising. I looked at a few pictures, read a couple of descriptions, and I I, I seconded his um, promising. I believe, which you can do on Mushroom Observer. You can anybody can vote who's a member and upgrade or downgrade a um, a proposal. And I've looked for this again, and I went up in the same area of my property, and I, I think probably that tree fell down, and you know, and maybe the fungus was pushed into the ground or something and didn't develop anymore. It's hard to say, but I, I couldn't find it again. All right, cool. More porium, which means this stuff is resupinate and has pores. <laughs> so, it, isn't that isn't it poria? Isn't that like an like an old genus, like a catch-all genus? It's an old it's yeah. an old um, uh, depreciated genus, I believe. Yeah. And they they use the name on Mushroom Observer to basically mean, you know, what I just said. I, I believe it's probably posted as poria. Sensu latu, which means more or less in the broad sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's a pretty cool looking thing, you know, that um, if you do a, a zoom on it, you can see the pretty good detail here. You know, um, these, these types, these types of pores thing. that are kind of angular and like different sizes, they always remind me of Seraporia. Yeah, which okay. was a, there was a whole bunch of them, whole bunch of them. Oh, okay. In fact, I have a Seraporia that I'll show that has the same kind of pattern, but it's a different. It's not the species, though. Yeah, I, I guess you just have to do a little bit of work with these things to get a better, you know, any kind of decent idea. Um, yeah. I mean, that was. I, I think this observation is from like eight years ago, and. In in the in that eight year interim, I've increased my willingness to like do a little extra work with with things I bring home. Um, but I thought it was just a cool looking thing. It fits, you know, what we're talking about. So I thought I'd put it out there. Sure. Look, yeah. Look, this Eriporia group is the one with purple and pink, I think. Yeah, pinks, or oranges. Yeah, definitely pinks, oranges, oranges. You touch them and they they stain. They they, they change the color. 
Yeah, I think they I do. Have, I found it, but I can only go as far as call them seriporio. That's it. Hmm. Uh, except for one seriporia purpurea. Yeah, that's actually the one I have to show. Yeah, I have, I have that one. I think it grows on conifers. It's, yeah, I, yeah, I think one. this is probably on like poplar or something, you know, like true poplar. All right, last one. Okay, I forget what I even, what I sent you. It's, oh, Flavia, I guess this this fits in with what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, Flavia radiata. I'm I'm pretty sure that's what this is. This this one I know. You know, it's rubbery. It's just all these like little nodes or undulate or an undulating surface, sort of wavy sometimes. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a pretty cool looking thing to find. Um, I guess there's not a whole lot more to say about it, really. I didn't do much uh, analysis on this. I, pretty much when you find one of these Flevia species, um, if you're familiar with the genus, you usually you, you can, you can peg it pretty quickly be, just based on the texture of of the um of the context these were all over a beach log at sherman hoffman um sanctuary the next day i walked through the same area again and it was all scraped off and eaten by some animal oh, hmm. oh. <laughs> whether it's raccoons or bear or whatever i don't know wow well the area i think this is this one's from susquehanna riverlands i think and there's a lot of squirrels there. It's, yeah. I don't think there's any pear, bears down there. There's probably some raccoons, hard to say. Um, yeah, that's from Susquehanna Riverlands. Um, uh, interesting though, yeah, because um, I think I saw this same fruit body again, um, maybe at an earlier or later time, probably later, because this looks like it's just reaching maturity okay that's what i have thanks all right cool marisol you said you wanted to say something yeah about the flavia radiata in the books they call about it saying that it's waxy it has a waxy feeling to touch and also in we found it many times with this color but it could be yellow grayish brown and it you will be like the color deceives you yeah, yeah yellow. I, yellow is is what I find sometimes. More peachy. Yellow ochre. Oh yeah, peachy too. Uh -huh. Peachy yellow. Uh huh. Cool. Well, thank you, Dave. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. That's what I got. Marisol. Check out this photo set. You there, Marisol? I am, I am. Okay, cool. So this is the first one, Stecorinum robustius. I showed this to you before. And today I'm showing like five or six uh, Stecorinum species because I thought it was so cool and all the different ways they present themselves. This one I found it in my neighborhood. Um, and this one presents like a margin but it's interspersed with the teeth. In another example, in another photo, it's more even. Yeah, yeah, and, but you can still see the margin. Can you make it a close up to see the beautiful teeth? They are lighter at the tips. Mm -hmm. They kind of flat, or I, I cannot remember well if some of them were flat and some were like pointy. Yeah, and it was on um on a um, deciduous wood. And the color, ah, yeah, I did the spore print, and I got a lot of the spores. I did the micro also. I'm not sure that I posted the drawings of the micro there, but it belongs to that species, and. What makes the Stecherino um, group together be together is the presence of some um, cystidia 
that is very long. We're going to see it in other examples. You can pass. Oh, yeah, 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 right there. Oh. I took this from Nana Rosa. So this is an, it's an encrusted cystidia. It's called lamprocystidia. Hmm. Cool. Are these, um, are these stained? No, in water. That's their natural color? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay, any questions on that one? Robustius. There were so many fruiting bodies on that tree. They were having a feast. What was the wood again, please? Uh, no, an unknown deciduous wood. I have no clue. I couldn't tell. So some kind of deciduous wood. Yeah. It, is it difficult to find those cystidia? No. No, it's easy. Yeah. Oh, okay. You just get a little, little tiny thin piece of that and then you'll see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, so the, here there is another stecherinon. It's called Bordeaux tea. And it looks like a stecherinon ocrasium, but this one forms caps. And as it gets older and older, the cap looks like a bell. And you can see the zone grows on that bell. Mm. The same aspect with the teeth. And the curious thing is that the teeth are in, oh, they start close to the margin, but they are like an, um, there is an edge. You can see there on the left, upper left, yeah. And the, the, um, the cap is kind of close at the, at the end. You know what I'm trying to say? Like pinched. Yes. Mm -hmm. like right, right there. Mm -hmm. And on the other one that is showing the teeth, the cap, you can see that the teeth continue inside. You're close, mm -hmm. close. Yeah, I, yeah, right in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying yes. try not to shake the picture on you guys too much. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, that one's cool. And hey. the same presence of this uh, Lamprocystidia or whatever name, is, it's a type of cystidia. Huh. All right, very cool. So Stecherinum burgodii. On the deciduous wood. All right. Okay, uh, the photo is not that great, but still, you can see that it looks like a transparent stekerino. Oh. What do you mean, Dorothy? Dorothy, what do you mean? How, how um, well, you seem to have a reference. So how many species do you think we can find in New Jersey? The ones that I'm showing to you. And there are, I missed one. I forgot to post one more because I didn't want to like make it too long. So there's six oh, or seven, how many? Oh, yeah, probably more. Yeah, but I don't know them all. I, I put them together, the ones that I have found already. Okay. And this uh, one doesn't even, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And your reference, what? What book or? Oh, no, I just, in the Corticiae from Ana Rosa and the other ones, the Corticiae from Switzerland and online. I go online and in the Facebook, uh, Facebook group. So I did the micro for this one and I sent a sample to Karen Nakasone and she told me that it's an stekerino. But she doesn't know the species, and I don't know the right. species. Can can you put that online reference in the chat later? Yes. I I actually, you know what? I actually have a bunch of references that I'll share with you guys, and all those are in there, so she can point out the ones that she really likes. Um, so this is my second time finding this one, but the first one was a year ago in Georgia, and then this year I found it, I think in in. In, the, in this park that Liz goes near her house. Liz was to park Crystal Lake. I found it in Crystal Lake. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, oh yeah. So on the left, there is a drawing of one of the teeth and on the teeth, there are the cystidia, the ornamented cystidia sticking out plus the basidia, the little Smaller parts are the basidia. Hmm. Cool. So, 
So this one was found in Thompson Helmeta Park by somebody, I don't know who. And we had a good joke with it because from the top it looks like Trametes Ocrasia. <laughs> it passed from hand to hand, Trametes Ocrasia, Trametes Ocrasia. And then John looked underneath and it has teeth and we were laughing. And then I cannot remember how we found out that it was this one. I think that I put, I posted on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, you put it on Facebook, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody told me that it was that. And the incredible thing that is that this one is like a polypore polypore. It's, it's thick and fat and, and like a shelf. Shelf, I'm sorry. Oh, these ones, you can actually, if you look at these spines under a really good loop, you can actually see those uh, lamprosistidia projecting outwards. And also this one has a wonderful smell of like lemon. It has a wonderful smell. And the same, this one doesn't have the um, ornamentation. I don't know why, but it belongs to that group, the Stecherinum family. Yeah. Yeah, there's no encrusting on it. See, I don't but, know why, yeah. But yeah, these are the things that you can see on those actual spines. Mm -hmm. Like in your last one, you had the drawing with all the lamprosistidia sticking off of it. So, so it's the cystidia that are not ornamented, is what is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. This one is always—it's always the smell that gives it away. If you sniff it, you'll you'll never forget that smell. Okay, so here's your acrasia. Hey, here comes yours. <laughs> it's the Kerino no Crasio. It's so common and I found it all the time. And it loves, it loves beach. No, 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 beach, birch and cherry. And this one, I did, this one has the ornamented mm, cystidia. And the, I have, I see that the spores are like the same in all of them. And another thing is that this one is a flat, flat one and it has a margin. Yeah. This one, can you show the other one? No, the first one. Mm -hmm. This one, I thought I found something really different. And when I took a, a closer look, it happened that this Stecherinum is parasitizing. I he no, he no, I cannot remember the olivacens. Hinoporia, the yeah. Hinoporia. Olivacens, yeah. yeah. You cannot see it too good, but it's, that's why this, on top of having teeth, is having the other shape of the cross that is parasitizing. Oh. It's giving an extra texture. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. This one has teeth with teeth on it. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> so is that is that just a, a type of growth form or or does it mean it's older or younger? Oh, no, I, no, I, no. I imagine it's just a type of growth form. No, it's growing on a cross that has teeth so it, the the surface oh the i see yeah oh I, mm -hmm. oh I get it i'm it's sorry old, oh yeah okay i'm glad old, i asked it's the old hidnokiti olivaceum yes mm -hmm. oh oh i see so the brown stuff is one type of fungus yeah and then right. the and then the saccharinum is growing on top of it uh -huh. showing the shape of the cross that mm. was underneath nice one All right. And this one is a polypore. Mm, it's called Stecherinum nitidum. And the photo is pretty bad. And it's a, it has pores, but it belongs to the family of Stecherinum. They have another name too. I cannot remember. But I did the micro and I posted on Facebook and immediately they jumped and told me it's Stecherinum nitidum. Jungundia, that's the other name. Jungundia nitidum. Hmm. Does that stain? No, I don't think so. It was very thin. Mm -hmm. hmm. On the deciduous wood too. And I found the, these drawings online, the same um, ornamented cystidia. Cool. I, so, I, so the so the old name for that is Junghunia. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I forgot to add one more that is the Stecherinum fimbriatum. 
Remember that one, look? It has mm -hmm. a different name now. It's mm. pink with, with rice or morse. Mm, it's okay. <laughs> I, it's okay. I'm good. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Marisol. That's a nice photo set there. Okay, so the Berghartz. John and Nina. Okay. So I put... Yeah. The, those look very much like, very very similar sort of they both look sort of like bacon strip strips and you might think that they're the same thing but when you turn them over they look different um the top one is the uh yes yeah, see the 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 top one is salubius uh sub pileatus pili and the and the bottom one is uh puncture puncture laria strict so, so Zoma, right? So, yeah, that, like he said. And right. uh, yeah, so uh, just to show show how much, that's why you always got to turn things over because they look like one thing on one side. You think might mistake it on, if you just look at the cat. But if you turn it over, they're totally different. And these were gotten at fungus patches. We, they were brought in and um and uh tom bigelow identified them all right cool so this one up in the top that's hey look that's at that that one. that's the uh xylobus yeah. subpileatus yeah right. see the white bottom and then the bottom one that's the punctularia uh, strigoso strigoso punctuari i'm sonata. sorry sonata yeah there we go punctularia strigoso zonata the tree bacon. Yeah. Right. One thing about the um, Silobolus subpileatus is, is um, related to Silobolus frustulatus. But remember the ceramic parchment? Yeah. It's, it's fragmented. This one is more uh, extended. And if you touch it, it's hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The um, punctularia is more flexible. So the subpileatus refers to the fact that it, it's almost forming caps. Uh huh. It does form caps laterally. Yeah, yeah. Because it looks like it does form caps here, but maybe maybe at times it's more resupinate. I'm it, guessing. Yeah, it grows caps, but the biggest area is the uh, resupinate. Yeah, it is under uh -huh, the tree and it's big. Yeah, you find, you'll find like big sheets of it that are like resupinate flat against the wood. And then in certain areas where it'll be projecting these caps outward. And it loves oak. Yes, both are found on oak. Hmm. All right, cool. Can you show the names again, please? Yes. So those two that we were just looking at, that was that one, the Punctularia strigosa zonata. And then this one, Xylobolus subpileatus. There's supposed to be an L right yeah. there. Right oh, there. Oh, oh, right. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all right, you good with the names on that one? So it looks like the next one we're looking at is, I think this one, Cystosterium uh, oh, murrayi. No, this one, no, no, this is the- uh, Oh, I see. Yep, Jerkandera. Yeah. It just shows there's two. This shows the two. This comes from a nymph, and it shows the two different uh, growth stages. That it um, one is older, and then the younger one. And we find this a lot. It, it's gray underneath. Hmm. So how do how do you guys pronounce this? I always say Jerkandera. I always say Jerkandera, but that's all right. Jerkandera. Jerkandera. Okay. Jerkandera. Yeah. The B is silent. No. Oh, you do say B, but jerk candor. Jerk candor. At least that's how I always heard it. Okay. Soft B. I don't Soft know if that's right. <laughs> I I thought it was a silent B, but oh maybe. I don't know. 
Huh. Yeah, I'm I'm just guessing. I don't know how to say it really. And this is this is one that was gotten in uh, that horrible uh, where we all roasted to death at the Nemp and uh, Fitch, Fitchburg, and uh, this is uh, th this one this the whole part half of the room was smelling of coconut, and th so this one smells of coconut, and that's this boring looking thing you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it had such a smell. Uh, I may be projecting, but it looks like it has suffered similarly to <laughs> it was on here. Yes. At, at he has suffered what? Oh, it was about 100 degrees. Were you at oh, Fitchburg, oh. Marisol? <laughs> my, my room was 88 degrees at 3 oh, o'clock no. in the morning, oh. which is like really bad. Um, Apparently, that was because it was a high rise. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was on, I don't know, like four, six or something. It was... so this, well, you don't remember what tree this was on. It was on the, you can't quite see the slip, but. It says hickory. Hickory. Oh, hickory. I yeah. find this up here. I would have said it was on conifer, but maybe not. But I just put this as an example of the fact that you can have a very, very boring mushroom. But when you have you have a very strong smell and that yes. can tell you what yeah. it might be. Yeah. Well, I just wrote it down because I'm going to smell the ones that I find now. Yeah. See if that's see if it is that. And also check if it's deciduous wood or not. <clears throat> okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, Dorothy. Ah, I think I sent two, right? Yes, <laughs> no. you did. You have people pictures, good heavens. Yeah. I hope you're not uh, saying they're crusty. I hope you're not saying that. First. Yeah, kind of saying, I remember that picture of me and Sam. <laughs> you want to look at your picture, people? Here, go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, I don't know whether new members know, but in 1971, um, there was an article in the Denver, no, Dover Advance, which is a Northern Jersey newspaper. And it was about someone wanting to form a mushroom, a wild mushroom hunters club. And the guy in the middle right here, Hiram Korn is the one that kind of placed the ad or wrote the article. And he got a response and the following year, uh, people that responded um, made the club uh, a different name called the Lakeland My Mycology Club. And in three years after that, it became the New Jersey Mycological Association. So Hiram was the first president and the fellow right over here is Ed Bodsman. He was the second president. And this is Neil McDonald, the great artist. I have some of his uh, artwork hanging in my living room. Um, and um, so that's kind of neat. But 1971, hey folks, um, we're in our 50th year. Yeah. And so someone needs to think about once this COVID thing is over to have another dinner. So Susan, where was our 25th anniversary dinner in White House Station? What was the name of the place? Whatever it, the place was next to the railroad tracks. I don't remember the... I, I, can't, I couldn't remember I the remember name. I remember the name of the place. I've been gone too long, but it was right next to the railroad tracks in uh, White House Station. Right. Dorothy? So if you think of it, let me know. <laughs> I think I just ran across, across a flyer for it. We had a, a big do at the 25th. Yeah, uh, Susan ran it. And uh, this is a picture inside the restaurant. And these are some of the past presidents at the 25th anniversary, including Sam Ristick. So here's Sam, Ed Bosman, Ray okay. Gatto, Jean Varney, Jim Very Richards. Nice. What? Left to right, because there's a lot of people who won't know any of these people. Okay, so left to right, Sam Rishtik. He's our guru from New Jersey who moved to Maine. Here's Ed Bosman. 
who after a few years with our club actually moved to Connecticut and started Connecticut Valley. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ray Fado, who's famous for the Russula Key, Jean Varney, uh, plant pathology professor at Rutgers, Jim Richards, who's our editor, Bob Peabody, he's our historian. He's what? He's watching if he if he's still on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bob Peabody, um, who uh, sponsored the or started the Wild Foods foray. Um, this is Neil McDonald, Bob Hosh, who some of us know, um, but we don't see him much anymore. Another early president was Victor Gambino, Vic, and this is Grace, his wife, because um, Vic, unfortunately, uh, died before this anniversary. Greta Turchik, who was a uh, treasurer and one of the early members for 25 years. Hannah Chekinow, um, who actually got us started helping with New Jersey poison control. She was a nurse in Newark. And that's me. <laughs> okay. Um, and here is dear Sam Rishtik our guru, and Susan with a pair of lichen dyed mittens and, and um, tooth fungi too, uh, that she made for him. So you want me to send you that picture, Susan? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you have it in digital form? Yes. I haven't it, looked like that in quite a few years. <laughs> <laughs> but you've, you've, you're smiling, which is yeah. good. <laughs> Okay, a little history. And this, I, I have no idea what it is. I took this so many years ago, but it's probably a stecorinum. Yep. But it, it wasn't, maybe it was older, so it's not so orangey. What do you think, Maricel? Yeah, it is, it is. It looks older, yeah, but it, it is. The okay. white margin, yeah. Oh. Actually, it was much, um, it, it looks more orange than it did on the thing I sent. <laughs> okay. And then I sent something else, right? Yeah. One second. I just closed my email by accident. I was searching for some things and I... Um, they're scattered everywhere on my websites and stuff. So I found this under uh, a very wet decayed log and it was soft to the touch. I do believe that the next slide shows the spores. I was hoping it was something like uh, tomatilla, which is actually um, a fungus that's mycorrhizal with um, um, orchid, terrestrial orchids. But I have no idea. And I did this probably more than 10 years ago. So I have no clue about anything anymore. But I thought I'd throw it up there. Dorothy, tomentelas have is echinolate spores. Okay. On, yeah, this is, this is, they could be. Uh, this is Botryobasidium simile. I wrote the name on the chat. Mm -hmm. The spores are like lemon shape. Mm -hmm. I agree with that too. Ah, okay. Wow. Thank you. Those spores, those are canidio spores. So they, they would form long chains if they were not, you know, disturbed. Uh, and it's, it's soft to the touch, this thing. It's powdery. Yeah, you touch it and then you get the spores everywhere. Ah. And it's very common and it loves and rotten wood. Thank you. I'm going to write down the name. And this last thing, um, was very tiny. So I'm not sure. Is that that, that, that blue ceruli thing? <laughs> Icoderma. I lean a name on that too. 
Oh, trichoderma. Okay. Trichoderma? Mm -hmm. Oh. Hmm. I think that is the anamorph of, what's the other name? Trichoderma, trichoderma, uh, I can't remember. Some kind of anamorph. And there are many green ones, so it's like a complex group. It was a pretty color anyway. <laughs> Beautiful, yep. I, I showed it to people and you know, no one could tell me what it was. Yeah, Strichoderma viride group. Okay. Viride. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Several, several of them. All right, Is thank this you. thing a, an ASCO or a Basidio? ASCO. So, so it might then be confused with the um, cyano, I, I, I forget how to say Oh, it. oh, the, la, the little green cap? Yeah. No, no, this one is like cottony. Yeah, if you look oh, at it. Oh, cottony. cottony, yeah. Well, yeah. that would immediately mm -hmm. step right, I see. Okay. Yeah. It looks like if you touch it, you're going to have that blue, blue like canidia spores all over your fingers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. yep. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Dorothy, for thank you. For both your people picture and your crust pictures. Okay, so here are mine. Can so I just I ask a question? Is somebody keeping track of who each president is since about 15 years ago? Is somebody a historian in the club still? No. I to keep that up, but unless you're keeping your newsletters, you won't remember who's president. Right. Um, I have it. I have what Bob Peabody uh, did. He was historian. Yes. Uh, and I sent that to uh, Liz uh, because she's uh, on the committee now for the web uh, website and she's doing some historical article for it. So they're trying to do a new website for our club. There is, there is a list. I have a list that has been put together of all the officers from the beginning. Oh, great, Jim. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to see it sometime. I can say yeah, that I it. have from the beginning through, I think, 97. <laughs> no, I have then, I have all the officers and a uh, newsletter editor from the beginning. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so I, I put together this list. I put together these first five. These are ones that I felt like they're, they're easy to identify without microscopy because, you know, a lot of these crusts that we look at, you really need to look at them with a microscope. So the first one I have is Dendrothela nervosa which is this white looking, like just substance. Oh, on hemlock. No. Um, I, I mean, um, yeah. Atlantic yeah. or red, red, cedar. red cedar. Yep. So that's how you know what this is. So you, you'll see a lot of these dendrothelas, these white, they're just like white patches and they grow on all kinds of different trees. Um, on the Atlantic red, I'm sorry, the Eastern red cedar. What is that? Juniperus virginiae. Yes. You have the, the white dendrothelia that grows on there. So they're obligate to that tree. So when you find them on there, you can be pretty sure that they're nervosa. That's the species name. <clears throat> I've never I've never been able to get spores off of them. Um, Karen Nakasoni, the crust lady, she told me you have to do them in the middle of the winter to get spores off of them. But that one's a pretty easy one to figure out once you remember that it's, that's the species that grows on that tree. Would that be during a, a warm period during the middle of the winter? I don't know. She told me the dendrothelas, they're, they're winter mushrooms. You have to collect them in the winter to get spores off of them. Huh. Maybe, oh. maybe collect it and bring it inside and let it warm up a little bit. Um, I, that seems interesting to me that something would be prone to sporulate. In the, yeah, is, yeah. is that a Southern thing? More... more no, the, no, they they live here, and I know they live up in Connecticut because that's where I learned them. Huh. Was out of Nymph in Connecticut. Oh, okay. Um, you know, a lot of these things, um, 
you know, like I went out like earlier, like in January and it was like in the forties, you know, the, the, the days were going up to the forties and overnight going down like into the thirties. And, um, I got spores off of like six or seven different polypores. Yeah. You were saying that last time, last, yeah. last winter was mild around here. And, um, I got really nice spore collections off like some Trinides and, and a few other things. Yeah, I think a lot uh, of those in January, February, March. Yeah, a lot of those polypores, they just like that really cool weather. So and Larry Millman, he's the one who always points out, you know, that's why you're looking for crust in the winter because they're active. What's he always he always says that the uh the logs are like parkas. You know, they have parkas on them over top of them. So you flip them over and that you find them underneath and they're nice and cozy underneath their parka logs. So. They be, like maybe a week ago or so, I was still getting spore prints from from the crusts. I leave them uh, on the on the slide uh, throughout the night, and then the next day I can get a good spore print for a crust. Oh, okay, thanks. Interesting. Okay, so I put this one in there, the Hydnoporia alvatia because this one's so super common. Yeah. It's, it's very easy to recognize. So it's just their teeth, they grow on the sticks. You always find them on these sticks and they're just full of these brown teeth, kind of unremarkable when you look at them, um, but they're kind of cool. And they long, form these long sheets on um, deciduous wood. That's what I always find them on is deciduous. Look. Yes. Excuse me. The stecherino nocrasion that was growing, it was growing in this, this one, the one was that was showing the teeth over, it was this oh, cross. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Maricel's, Maricel's stecorinum. That's what this was growing on. Right. Yeah. So this is an easy well, one. Once, thank once, you, Maricel. That, that sheds light on, on, that, on your observation. Interesting. Well, thank you. Sam Rishtik once said to me, when this was still called uh, Hidnokiti olivacea. He said, wow, you can be a specialist in this genus because there was only one species. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, if you um, look with the lens, it's beautiful. Right. Next time you find it, look at it, it's beautiful. And sometimes the tips are cut by accident and it reveals like a darker uh, center. And when it's baby on the edges, it's beautiful. Next time, when it's fresh, it's really nice. So I imagine you can see sete on the, on this with a hand lens. No, no, I, oh, yes, yes. I would, uh -huh. I would think I would think you would be able to. Yeah, it's an Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So another, an, another thing you can do with this is if um if you're unsure about it, if you take a little drop of KOH and put it on there, yeah. because of because of the family it's in, it turns instantly black. So what okay. is it really called now? Oh, right here. Hidnoporia olivacea. Oh, Hidnoporia. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Here's the Seroporia purporia. This one's pretty easy to recognize out in the field. Although there are some similar ones that look kind of like it. That I've yet to see, but I know there are. So they have these pores. Actually, one second. Let me look at this. So... One of the things we're always looking at when we're trying to identify these polypores is how many pores there are in a millimeter. So if you take a clear millimeter scale and put it over top, you know, you use your hand lens and you count how many pores are in there. So these have three to four pores per, per millimeter. It kind of gives you an idea of how big they are. So remember earlier, Dave, when I was pointing out on that one saying how the pores on seroporia are always kind of really angular but different sizes yeah it looks like the thing i showed before mm -hmm. yeah, i agree i mean it might not be the same species but so so th this one like this the purporia they it there it tends to be purple but if you can actually see the edges of them are kind of whitish so they have a kind of a weird color like that and, they, and it kind of stains a little bit when you touch it this one i just actually I just found this just a couple of weeks ago. So growing on the underside of a, a log. 
Hey, you got company there on the right. <laughs> Oops, dang it. What are you looking at? The cross, the white cross. Oh, yeah. Another photo. Yeah, yeah, that one, that one, that one. Sorry, Mary, so I didn't identify that one. No, no. <laughs> I mean, not that I will. Know. Wow, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> I do remember seeing that on there. I, I kind of meant to get to it, but I never did. Mm -hmm. But I did get um, spores. So this, I, I found this right at Christmas time. I remember that. And um, I got a nice spore print off of them. They have these really cool allantoid spores. Narrow, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but I don't think you even really need to see the spores to identify this one. There's another species. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it was um, the type specimen was found here in Pennsylvania just a few years ago, like it maybe in like the nineties. And that was the only time it was ever found until the nymph up in um, upstate New York in 2018. It was found by George Hungerford and they sequenced it. And that was the second time it had been found. The name of that's escaping me, but it's uh. So so, so the, the those spores were from the, um, Syriopora, right? Not from the. Not not from the crust, no. Yeah. They were they were from this purple, right. polypore. Yep. Okay, this one I put up here. This is a very common one. I'm sure everybody has probably seen it, but, uh, Zalabalus frustulatus. So that's the parchment crust. So we were looking at those uh, ones that John and Nina were showing, those strips, and they had the one that had the white bottom. So this is the other one in that genus, and it forms these super, super hard parchment-like crusty things on the wood. And man, they are rock hard. They, for some, they always grow on oak, and whatever they do to the wood, they make it rock hard. Like if you try to break it off with your knife, you can break your knife on the wood. It becomes so hard. Look. Yes. They, the cystidia on these syllabolus is really beautiful. It's look, it looks like a brush. Oh, yeah. Like this brush to, to wash the baby bottle. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. huh, I'll, have to, I'll have to look at that. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last one I did that was super easy to identify is Tirana cerula, cerulea. Which is in the polyporaceae, so it's in that kind of polypore family, but it's not poroid, but it's got that electric blue mm -hmm. color to it. It's the only thing I've ever seen that has that color to it. I think there's a Gary Linkoff name for this one. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't have the book here with me. Cobalto cross. Cobalt, um, cobalt blue crust. Cobalt, I know it in Spanish. Yeah, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll look. I'll look later. It's a type of blue cobalt. Tarana. Yep. Tarana. Uh, Gary Linkoff. Um, I was trying to search some crust photos on online, and he's got a blog on his blog thing. His name came up, and he he has a whole bunch of. Uh, Oh, let's see, 25 crusts with pictures. And, and this is right up at the top. Uh, the old name was Pocaricium um, Ceruleum. Say that again. It's now called uh, T-E-R-A-N-A, -A, Tirana Cerulea. Yeah, but what was it in Gary's book? Uh, or online on his There you blog. go. Was it this? Pulcherisium? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the nice thing about uh, Mushroom Observer is you can click on a link and you can see the depreciated synonyms of it. Well, or what you usually have to do now is if you find it in Gary's book, you, you go to Google for whatever the current name is. Yep. What does it mean when it says depreciated synonym? It's what, an old name. Correct. Yep. It's an old. It's an old name, and it's been uh, renamed for some other re, for 
for I think one of a couple of reasons. Um, yeah, you can you you can also go to fungus. Uh, uh, oh, what I'm sorry. Um, index fungorum. Yeah, yeah. Be species yeah. fungorum. Index fungorum. Yeah. Um, Dictionary of the fungi. And they've just recently updated it, so it works a lot better now. It used to be kind of slow and clunky, um, but now you just you can put like a genus name in the search or a species name, genus plus uh, species, and you immediately get sent to a page um, that shows uh, what this thing is. And if it's a depreciated name, it'll tell you. Um, and if it's a current name, it'll tell you. And it'll give you the depreciated synonyms. The, the only thing is that you don't get out of index fungorum, since it's a global uh, sort of um, catalog. Um, if something is now named differently in North America than Europe, um, then you would need to sort of recognize from the names of the authors, um, you know, if that might be the case, a, a, a continental difference. Plus, when you're putting in that name, boy, you have to spell it correctly or you'll get nothing. <laughs> yeah, you yes. get, you get nothing if you mess up the spelling. Yeah, yes. but that's, that's really the right way to do it because a lot of fungal names are, the spelling is pretty similar. And if you, if you have some sort of feature that guesses at what you're talking about, it's going to guess wrong sometimes. So, so yeah. there's, there's three reasons that I can think of that why names become depreciated. One is because two different authors described the same mushroom like separately and they didn't know about each other and they each gave it their own specific name. So in that case, whoever was the first one to write it gets the original name. So sometimes we discover that after the fact and we have to depreciate a name because we realize there was an older name that was more accurate. Um, sometimes people will describe the same mushroom because as a couple different mushrooms, like they think they're different mushrooms, but they eventually realize that they're looking at the same species. So again, whoever had the original name gets the, uh, gets, gets the name. So you have to depreciate all the newer names. And then finally, there's like really strict taxonomic rules about naming mushrooms. So if you screw up, like if you make your microbate number wrong on the submission, you can get your name depreciated pretty quickly because there are people, they can be really unforgiving about that. Um, so your name might become depreciated quickly because you didn't have the right name and, or you didn't follow the um, procedures correctly and somebody else beat you to it. Luke? Yes? I just don't know English well. And, and I hear like two words, deprecated and depreciated. Is that the same? Um, I think you're probably talking about the same thing. Oh. I think... Deprecated. How do you pronounce deprecated? I think it is deprecated. Ah, okay. Oh, deprecated. Okay. Yeah. Look at the look at the spelling of the word. I think that's what mm -hmm. I see in motion of said, but deprecated. Deprecated. There's no I yeah. in that word. Okay. Deprecated is what I've always heard. Okay. There you go. Deprecated. Yeah. So I'm just saying it wrong. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit dyslexic, and I screw up <laughs> middle of words, so I probably I have been saying the wrong thing for years now. And. <laughs> And actually, um, in a lot of the field guides we use, the names have changed. But you know, people still know what you're talking about using the synonyms. So, mm -hmm. yep. it, 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 it to our the lady who questioned, you know, it, it's not a, a terrible bad thing about the old name. So, I still use half of them. <laughs> So you can still call it Swillis pictus, even though everybody says it's spraggy eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because of somebody else who described it. Nobody knows. OK. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a similar European species. I'm not sure about that one. Um, I would have to check. This is a peck name. Oh, it's a peck name. Oh, OK. Uh, which, okay. again, like you say, if it was described in Europe and, Europe and then found to be the same thing that we have here, then that would be why it would be hmm. the same as Europe, which would be the European name. But so, that so what, what did Peck like, call it? Hmm? Did, did Peck call it Pictus? Pictus. 
Yeah, that's, well, a... that's an interesting one then. I wonder why Spraggy Eye is. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. Hmm. Because right. it seems unlike it seems unlikely that the same species would occur in North America and Europe uh, because white pine is really a North America tree. And that's what Swills Spraggy Eye grows under all the time. Yeah, it's a good question. So, they yeah. But yes. there are very strange things in the world of fungi because there is a mushroom, a fungi, an ascomycete. It's a kind of a puffball. I don't remember the name, but it grows only in Texas and Japan. Only the same one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, I suppose it may, the same thing may have uh, evolved the same way. Sometimes there's this thing called convergent evolution where two things evolve differently, but end up with the, the same genetic profile. That's a kind of a problem, I guess, for people who want to base. Not, um, not, not genetic profile, but characteristics that are that they've evolved for the habitat they're in. That's convergent evolution. Like, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, you're right, Dorothy. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm not describing that correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the DNA would would distinguish between the two different entities um, that that have exhibited um, convergent evolution. The, I'm wondering though if if um, the same sort of thing might happen on on a genetic level. I mean, it seems to be a really low probability. No, that couldn't happen on a genetic level. No. No. We're talking about millions and millions of, uh, you know. But I wanted, to, I wanted to bring up um, Amanita phylloides. That was European, but it's here because they brought over soil bound roots on trees. Right. But, but Amanita phylloides is like, it's very. What, what would you say, cosmopolitan, I think? It just associates with with a lot of different types of trees. In Europe, and, it's on oak. Here, it's mostly on uh, uh, Norway spruce and other some other pines. I well, forget. they get it out west on on um, other other types of things. Uh, there's, there's, I don't think there's much Norway spruce out in California, and, and that's where it's really ha had taken off. I found it here. I found it here in three places. I found it in pl in, in between planted oak and some sort of two, two needle pine. I found it, and that that was that was studied by Karen Hughes, by the way. And, yeah. But I just, and I'm just it. saying that because you can have some European species here. And right. I, I, I understand just... the I understand the point, but but Swilla spragii only associates with white pine well the only the only way to really resolve that would just be to look it up and see why the name, name yeah was, i know yeah yeah i i will it, do that it, it, it probably has something to do with somebody probably described it before peck yeah 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 there was a lot of people working before peck he wasn't that long right and, right and, and yeah, it's a pretty I distinctive heard... mushroom too somebody probably tried to publish it once, yeah, that, I, that... once I heard that after they said spraggy eye they were going to make it Pictus after go back and make it Pictus again because the name was like not uh, well established or something or other. Oh boy! They, they can make that rule. <laughs> you know what? I think Walt Sturgeon may have mentioned that to me once, hmm. and I, it's crazy. The yeah. name game thing is crazy. Yeah. It is. Well, here's let's go back to the crust because here's another one that the name has changed recently. In fact, I went and fixed it on my mushroom observer today because bef before it was called uh phalinus inermis oh. so but now it's called fulvifumis inermis and that's all dna that's genetic that they've just been working on the dna of the phalinus and splitting it up <clears throat> but this is a resupinate phalinus um that's pretty easy to identify because it's obligate to holly trees and there's not many things that grow in hollies so it grows on ilex. So I found this in New Jersey, down like in like Cape May County, I think, down south somewhere, um, growing on an old holly tree. And it's not very remarkable. It's just kind of a small, flat, uh, 
brown polypore. But again, growing on holly where you don't really find very many things on holly. So I didn't do microscope work on this. Usually you do microscope work on these flat felinus things. Um, I didn't do that on there. I just kind of went on the, uh, on the assumption that I was good because it was on that holly. So that's why I only gave it a, uh, a promising vote on there. Luke, and did you know, did you hear about it before that it grew only on holly or how did you find out? Because I'd read about it in um, the North American polypores. Oh, okay. That was really something. Cool. And then the last one I'll show, this Mycoasia uda, because this thing is just so cool. And I got some good pictures of it. I found this in the fall, I believe, yeah, in October. I found this in October on a uh, piece of hardwood branch just laying on the ground. It was underneath. So I picked the branch up and just an old piece of debarked stuff. And uh, it, had, it was just covered in this, these yellow teethy things. I have that. I saw it actually just uh, this weekend. I've oh, yeah? got a picture of it. Yes. Okay. So one of the cool things about it is when you put on KOH on it, it turns this like cherry red color instantly. You put it on there, it just instantly stains this cherry red. So, so that was a pretty cool one. There it is. That's what it looked like. So that that's a stick that was probably about four inches thick, three or four inches thick and it was, you know, upside down. So it just looked like a piece of, you know, regular old stick and you know, I kicked it over and that's what was underneath of it. <laughs> so, and there's a whole bunch of these mycoaceas that grow around here. I've found like th two or three other species here in Philadelphia since then, but this one's really remarkable. And I think, I don't know if all of them do, but the ones, all of them that I've seen, the KOH always has some kind of reddish color on that. So let me back out of here. So Marisol had a few other ones that we can look at, right? Let me ask real quick, was there anybody else that had any they wanted to share? I know I asked that a couple of times in the beginning. I just want to make sure you guys have a chance. I, I do, but, and I joined late and I'm, I apologize. Oh, okay. So that's Bianca, right? Yes. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Um, and is there anybody else here that has anything they want to share? Okay, well, let's look at Bianca's and then we, we can look back at Marisol's and then we'll, we'll close with um, some references that I put together. Great, thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna get into the, the folder now. Can you see anything yet? No, not yet. Okay. You shared your screen? Uh, oh, that's right. Okay, so here's the share and there's the, there it is, okay. So I'm gonna go into these, let me see if this will work. I have a couple of these down here. All right. I don't know if this will work. Bear with me. Let's see. Let's go with this guy first. Can you see the photo that came up or no? No, we're looking at your uh, thumbnail still. Okay. How about now? Yes. Okay. You see your perro? Yes, you see my dog. He's <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I have, uh, I found this underneath. There was a bunch that was, you see the area that's missing on the log that was actually had fallen onto the leaves. And that's how I even saw there was anything on this log. Um, let me see if I can, can I go to the next photo? So this is one of the pieces that I picked up from underneath of the log. Uh, that's the underside of it. So I flipped it over. Mm -hmm. And that's a piece a little bit closer up again from that's underneath. The, that's the surface that was attached. 
Yes, this is the surface that was attached, exactly this white. And then, yeah, that's the same. Uh, this is me close, uh, close up. There's some green in there, There's, but they're very fine and very polypore with these very large cracks in it. I don't know if that's from age. Uh, let me see if there's a better, no, that's a different mushroom. Yeah, that's all I have. Um, and I, I don't even know where to start with this guy. I think it's a crust. I think it's a polypore crust, but I don't know more than, than that. Any thoughts? Well, it's definitely a, what we would call a polypore crust or like a resupinate polypore. Um, I'd say, unfortunately, it's probably a little bit old to be, probably be working with. Okay. If you look at it, you can see like the edges are, look like they've rotted a lot. Yeah, it does. It has the, the green on it and it has like very, that's why I wasn't sure. But it, the fact that it had fallen off, I was rather surprised. It, yeah. it looked very, um, you know, the material that you use for buildings. I thought it was maybe like somebody had just sprayed a, bu uh, sprayed a bunch of this uh, foam outside, but I do think it might actually be a, a, a natural growth. Yeah. Right, yeah so. all, that, all that green stuff is probably another fungus eating it. Oh, okay. That's possible. All right. So I will move on to this guy. Bianca. Yes. Um, do you turn logs that are in contact with the ground? Do I turn logs? I, I will now. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I have one uh, when I, I don't particularly think to do that. There was one that I sat on and it kind of turned and I saw when I looked down some of the, the mushroom and I took a couple of pictures. I don't know if that's, this was the same day. Uh, so I'll see if that, uh, I'll keep in, that in mind to do. You'd be surprised. Yeah, so this is another one. Um, it's very small, as you can see, this is my glove. Um, and it looked like a moss, but I'm very, based on, I'll zoom in, I'll show you the, the, the more detailed photo of, of it. I Cladonia think, lichen. What is it? Cladonia species, I have to go further with, um, with having the, the object, but it's a, a, it's a kind of lichen. It is in the fungus oh. kingdom. The genus is Cladonia. Cladonia lichen, okay. Cladonia. I typed it in. Oh, thank you. And those little brown bumps on it are the apothecia. <laughs> what does that mean? I guess it's the cap. Well, it's um, the apothecia are where the spores are produced. Ah, okay. Gotcha. Um, okay, so this is what you were, what looked like very similar to what you were showing, Luke. I wonder if I can zoom into this one. I know that one. <laughs> when you zoom in, is that what, do you see me zooming in? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna type that in. Okay. Go ahead, Dorothy, you know is it, it too. Is it Arpex? Yes. yes. <laughs> Milky tooth. Milky tooth. Well, that's easy. It okay. makes lacteus milk. Gotcha. Does it always stay white when it's older? Yeah, kind of like a bone white. Like yeah, a, creamy like a, white. Creamy mm -hmm. white, yeah. Okay, as opposed to that one, uh, Hydnoporia olivacea is always brown? Yeah. Yes. And to me, they look kind of the same. No, no, it's thicker. And yeah. this one may form caps too. Uh, in fact, okay. lacteus forms white caps. I mean, lateral caps. Isn't it always on oak? It's different deciduous. Oh, it can be other things, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I will type that in as soon as I get off of the screen share. And then I have this last one I thought was quite fancy and I didn't, uh, oh, I have, I don't know if the next one is a crust, but this will be my last one for today. So this looks, it's very like jet black color. It was actually hard for my camera even to focus on with the color. I had to make it lighter so you could even see anything. Um, so that's a close up of it. <laughs> no, this, no scoria. No scoria. Yeah, this is the scoria. Um, no, no. It forms 
for it, that was probably on a beech tree. Let's see. Well, I, I'm not very good at identifying trees yet. I'll ah, get better. Well, uh, the, uh, there are an aphid, lots of little white aphids. That's an insect mm -hmm. that, it, that uh, put their proboscis in the twig or the leaves and um, get the fluid, the sap out. And they make, they have so much sugar in their bodies that it passes out um, the, the other end. And then there's a, a fungus that um, starts decaying all that sugary stuff. Mm. And, and when it gets older, and it turns black. And it's the genus Scoria. Scoria, OK. All right, so this is the back of that, um, that uh, piece that I have uh, separated out. Right. Any more? So, okay. so if you've ever seen um, if you park your car under a tree and everybody says, oh, this, the sap's dripping on my car. Well, it really hasn't come straight from the tree. It's passed through this little insect called an aphid uh, or one of the many aphids. And it's a, a, actually a, a, the students at camp where we have a lot of beech trees, they call it a boogie woogie aphid because they're constantly jiggling around Lovely. So we'll go back in the summer. And All look, right. Look for these little white aphids. Okay, sounds good. All right. And I, I don't think this, this one is a crust, is it? Uh, <laughs> That's a lichen again. A lichen, okay. Okay, thank it's you. Folios. It's the folios. Type. Folios, folios lichen, leaf like, so it comes off. And okay. um, if it, had a hint of yellow in compared to the gray green ones is probably the common green shield lichen. Flavo, what was, Flavo parmelia caparata. What I was fascinated at no, is- No, no, I, take that back. It's one of the ruffle lichens. I can see the hairs on the edge. Yeah, I didn't know until I took the picture close up, I didn't even see these black hairs on it. So I was quite impressed with uh, the fact that there was such a difference when I took a closer photo. I'm typing in the name. Okay, thank you. All right, that's it for me. All right, thanks, Bianca. Thank you, everyone. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again for a few minutes, just so we can wrap up here with the crust. Um, Maricel? Yeah? You wanna take like five more minutes with these last couple crust? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just leave me a few minutes to the end, because I did I did get gather up some books. Yeah book uh, recommendations for people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a cross that shows words. Did I say it right? Mm -hmm. Words, yep. Words. Mm -hmm. Can you show the other photos? I do not remember if I found it on oak or pines because it was a big pile of them mixed, so I can I don't know, I can't tell. But maybe probably in the references for the cross, it will tell you what substratum it prefers. And it's very impressive because it has these beautiful words. And can you pass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can show the other one. I did the micro for the other one. Oh, what's the last photo? That was the last photo, yeah. Oh, oh okay, okay. No, the one in the right. Is that my, my micro or no? No, no, no. And then go to the other one. I posted to the Criobolos Karstenin. I found it, uh, this one in a speedwell. And then I found, I have found it like four or five times. And I did the micro and people on Facebook, they helped me to identify. So that's how I know it now. And when I did the micro, it has the most incredibly long cystidia. It's on the uh, upper left of the drawing right there. I didn't do the whole thing because it was really, really long. 
But as soon as, ah, and the, and the lower part on the left, the walls of the cystidia do not go to the tip. Look, can you show the lower left? Uh -huh. Yeah, they don't end. They have, yeah, it narrows uh, towards the tip. But immediately, uh, and the spores are like banana shape, banana, I'm sorry, banana shape. So uh, when I posted um, Ana Rosa Bernicchia, one of the references books that Luke is going to show you is by her. She's from Italy. She told me that it was this. Do they have crystals inside of them? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a lot of these crusts have like little crystalline structures on the insides of them, which is what she was drawing there. Yeah. And sometimes the shape of the crystals are clues for identifying them. And then there is another kind of the Acryobolus sudans. It's called the, the weeping crust. The photo's not that great, but if you can make it bigger, it's made out a little bigger. It has teeth, and you can see that at the end of each tip, the, um, it, it looks a little weird. There is a drop of matter coming out. That's why they call it the weeping crust. It's called the Acryobolus sudans. Are they hollow? No. They look hollow. Yeah, they look like ho ho hollow. But it's mm, something is coming out. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yeah. And it's the, related to the, the other Acryobolus carstenii. Acryobolus. Hmm. All right, neat. Now I have another cross with words. I showed this one before. Can you show the other photos that have better view of the words? No, the other one. Please, that one, that one. Um, it's the first time that I find it. And when I did the sport print, I was very surprised because the sport print has the same color of the floating body, like guava color. By accident, I was not looking for knowing that. And the spores are like, yeah, it's right there. Mm -hmm. Like kind of peach pink. And you can see the shape of the spores. And this long gloeocystidia, that's why it is called gloeocystidialum. It has this long, long gloeocystidia that is coming from the bottom of the crust. And it crosses the, the context and then goes to the where the basidia are where the, the spores are produced so just to clarify um i'm sure people are probably wondering about this all these different names like gloeocystidia and lamprocystidia the actual root word is this cystidia mm -hmm. and the cystidia is referring to these long cells that are projecting out of the uh out of the fruit body that we look at and you can only see them with a microscope but the beginning of it like Glowio and Lampro, um, those words mean different shapes that they might have. So for whatever reason, this one's a Glowio cystidium. I don't really know what the exact shape is. Like the Lampro cystidium are the ones, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Marisol, they're like long, but they usually have all the crystals on the end. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, there's dozens of different shapes and names. Yeah, You can spend all night just looking at that. You can make it simple saying cystidia. Cystidia, yep. yeah. I wrote the name Cystidia. And I was reading that they are accompanying elements uh, like to fill up the space between the basidia. Oh, yeah. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. That's good. Okay. And then your last one is Sister Streamer. Okay. This one, the basidia is the fertile part of a mushroom that produces the spores in the basidiomycetes and usually has four spores. This one has six to eight sterigmata. The, the basidia produ basidium produces six to eight spores at once. And you can see that this one, is all, this one also has warts. And this one can grow parasite on other fungi. Very cool. Is that how you identified that as a sister streamer, as the uh, basidia? Yeah, the number of uh -huh, six to eight is the All right, cool. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.
Can you guys see my um poly? I mean my uh, PowerPoint, or do you still see Marisol's stuff? Marisol's. Okay. We actually see your email. You see my email. Uh oh. We know your secrets. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see it. See. Yeah. Okay. So what I did, I just went through, um, this is, this is just a collection of books that I have. I'm sure there's probably other ones out there, but these are the books that I'm using myself, um, for identifying all of these polypores and to a lesser degree, the crust, um, none of them are cheap. I'll tell you that much. And almost all of them are written in Europe. There's just not that much stuff here in the United States. Um, this one, the poroid fungi of Europe, this is like, kind of an updated version of the North American polypores. It was written by the same people, or at least this one guy, uh, Rivardin. And um, a lot of his descriptions in there are the same exact things that were written verbatim from this an older, an older text, but it's full of color photographs. Um, and the same with this one, polypores of the Mediterranean region. This one just came out. Um, this one has amazing photographs in it and also has photographs of the microscopy. So like a lot of these other books have drawings of the microscopy, but this new, this newer one, the Mediterranean one, actually has photographs of the microscopic, microscopic features. Um, so these are two really nice polypore books. Uh, and the one thing I will say, even though they're written for Europe, a lot of the polypores here are the same for some reason or, or close enough that we can, uh, you can figure it out with these. Mm. Um, there are two photos. Look, can I say something silly? Mm -hmm. There are two microscopic photos on the polypores of the Mediterranean region that I sent to Ana Rosa. Yay! <laughs> yeah, from Trechispora um, hymenocystis that has some inflated structures, and I found it by chance. Yep. That's awesome. Congratulations. You're yeah. published. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't have a photo of the corticia? I do, I do. I'll get there. Yeah, sorry. Just... yeah. sorry. Forgive me. And, and then these are the other two polypore references that I use a lot. This one, again, another European one, Polyporaceae sensulatu um, by, I don't even know if this is a man or a woman, Bernicia. Um, Ana so, Rosa, she's the expert on crusts. Oh, okay. She's the Italian. She's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So she, I know it's an Italian, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an Italian person who is really, really good with this stuff. This is a pretty good book. Um, a lot of it's written in Italian. It has some English in it. Um, but the really detailed stuff is mostly Latin. So you just kind of figure it out from there. And it has colored photographs. And this set of books, North American Polypores, that's the, um, as far as I know, the only really comprehensive North American treatise on polypores right now. Um, and this, these books are actually out of print. They're not, you can't um, actually purchase them anymore, but they are available online as PDFs. That's what this uh, <gasps> link is down at the bottom. Um, I will say these, that book, the North American polypore book is hard to use. There's no, there's no pictures in it. It's all text and the line. North American polypores? Yep. Oh. It's all text and, um, but a lot of line drawings of microscopy. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's kind of useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. These books, these have both polypores and crust in them. Um, the Fungi of Temperate Europe, volume two, has a lot of cool crust photographs in it. And then this one, the Fungi of Switzerland, volume two, that's been kind of a mainstay amongst the crust people around here, you know, in North America. Um, again, European names, and a lot of it has changed, but it can at least get you in the right direction. And I think a lot of it's still kind of the same. Look. Yes. That's my Bible. That's your Bible. <laughs> yes. There you go. You heard it from her, from Marisol herself. Okay. And the last one, the last book is... Corticiaceae SL, um, again, Bernicia and uh, Gorhan. And this is a pretty good book, Color Photographs. This has more English in it than their other book, the Polypore book. Uh, I think most of it is all in English. Some of their stuff tends to be a lot, a lot of Italian, um, but that's a pretty decent book. Um, and it, has, it does have, that one has keys in it, I believe, doesn't it, Marisol? It has everything in English. It has a yeah. few lines on Latin or Italian, but everything rest else is in English. It's okay. good. I use yep. it a lot. All right. But it's not cheap. I'll tell you that. No. <laughs> none, of, none of these books are cheap. These, yeah. these are all expensive books. <laughs> um, here are a few um, online resources. So this one here, um, Microweb, if, if you guys have not been there, I'm going to go there in a second. They have all kinds of mostly older text that have been uploaded as PDFs. 
that are available online that you can download. So that polypore of North American, um, North America, both of those volumes are in there as PDFs. There's also this work by this guy named Burt, Edward Angus Burt right there. Um, he wrote, he worked like a hundred years ago. That stuff is super technical, but a lot of it's still really, really relevant. Um, this is for if you're getting really deep into these crust. And then finally, this Corticiaceae of Northern, of North Europe. That's a really extensive set of works in there. I'm going to actually go to this though, just to show people if I can. Look, may I say something? Yes. Also join the group in Facebook that is called Crust Fungi and Polypores. All these people, the experts, Anna Rosia, uh, Bernicia, and John, uh, and other ones are in there. They help. Yes, you're right. I should have. I didn't put any Facebook stuff in there, but you're right. All that stuff is, or that group is probably the best group on Facebook. So, okay. So here's that website I was just pointing out to you. So you guys can screenshot that microweb. Um, all these things in here are all different mycological literatures and keys. They're really, really great. If you go into mycological literature, you can see um, these different authors. I don't see it. You don't see this? No. Nope. Ay, ay, ay. Sorry. Do you see it now? No, it doesn't work. Okay, then I'm not going to do it. Then it's yeah. kind of I'm wasting the, I'm wasting everyone's time doing that. Um, you guys can follow the link on there. Now we see it. Oh, now you see it. <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm going to speed it up here. Um, if you go into the mycological literature, it has all these different authors. Um, these are some of the really traditional mycologists. If you go under here under other authors of North America. If you go down here to Gilbertson, right there, Gilbertson and Rivard, you can download those wow. North American polypores as PDFs. These are big files. Well, fairly big, not that big, but uh, they're pretty big PDFs. So you can get this stuff. You can download right there. So that's uh, definitely worth your while. All right. And then we made it. We made it. And last but not least in here, Alden Dirks, you guys can see my uh, PowerPoint again. Yep. Alden Dirks, he has this crustfungi.com. It's pretty new. He only has about a dozen species on there, but he promises he's going to keep filling it. But what he does have on there is really in depth. He really puts a lot of work into these. And then I just threw this up here because I use this all the time. This list, purple, blue, or supinate fungi list on, uh, on Mushroom Observer. It's actually just a list of purple and blue or supinate fungi, you know, mushrooms that uh, you can, that somebody put together into one list. And there's probably like 15 or 20 mushrooms on there that you can go there. So if you find something that's purple and blue and crusty, if you, you can go on there and hopefully find it. So with that, that is everything that I have. I hope you guys had a good time tonight looking at the crust fungi. And um, I guess we'll see everyone next week. So what is next week? Anybody remember is next week? I have it is here, February 5th, Judith Jacob Likens. Okay, and then what's our next? And then what's our next taxonomy oh, Tuesday? Chanterelles and trumpets. Ooh, chanterelles and trumpets. All right. All right. So everyone, dig up all their chanterelle and trumpet, black trumpet uh, photographs. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Everyone, have a great night, and I'll see y'all. Thank you. See you next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.